Just want to introduce our speaker today. It's great we've got a guest speaker this morning. Um, it's uh, Rob Coleman, who, who heads up uh, Christ Central in the Northwest. It's our team, team leader with, with Graham Webb, who you know well from Liverpool. So Rob's been a few times to us, quite a couple of years back since he's been. Mm -hmm. But it's great to have him with us. Great to think again as we're uh, just the things uh, going with Christ Central at the moment. It's great. In, in, in lay of the, the weekend coming up in a couple of weeks uh, just to have that real input from these guys. So uh, let's give Rob a warm welcome. He comes from Bolton, so Thank it's you. always wet in Bolton. So he's never seen the sun, and it's always sunny in the Wirral. Yes. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Nice to, nice to see everybody. Uh, yeah, it was, uh, we very much enjoyed ourselves last time we were here. I can't quite remember how, how long ago it was. And, and, uh, and also last time we had uh, the regional celebration, lights just been advertised next time in Liverpool when you had that here. Very much enjoyed that here. So my wife Helen is with me. And, uh, we also have uh, two kids. I'm going to mention one of them later as uh, part of what I'm saying. Um, so uh, our oldest Ben got married earlier this year and uh, he's now living in Norwich. Uh, our daughter Ruth is 23 and uh, she's down at Bedford. So we've been at Bolton for almost 23 years now. How did that happen? So the Lord called us up very clearly from Sussex. I uh, had no idea how long we'd be up here, but we're still here, we're still here, until the Lord tells us otherwise. Okay, so this morning, uh, I'm talking on the subject of thinking like a son and not like an orphan. And uh, it's so important, isn't it? I have to make sure this is working from here. Yes, it is working. I have to lift it up a little bit for the signal to reach. There we go. There's a, there's a, in Proverbs 23, verse 7, you can see it says, As a man thinks, so he is. So sometimes, you know, we say, oh yeah, I believe such and such. Um, and it's so important to see that how we think overflows, for better or for worse, into what we do, into what we say, into what decisions we make, what priorities we have, how we think about ourselves and about God and what the Bible says about the world and everything is so important. And today I want to talk about how we think about ourselves. Are we thinking about ourselves, seeing ourselves the way that God sees us? So let me just very quickly, by way of introduction, remind you that whether you're male or whether you're female, God declares over us, which is a privilege, that we are all called sons of God. So ladies, uh, sorry, gentlemen, you're probably familiar that another image that the Bible gives us is that we're all together as God's people, the bride of Christ. So if men have to handle being the bride, I think that you ladies can handle being sons. It's actually a, a, it, because the inheritance rights went through the sun. So God is actually saying, you are all inheriting. You all qualify. Amen. Now, what, when is a son a son? Just come back a little bit. That's it. That's it. It's not trying to live like a son that makes you one. That is our son on there when he was little. There's a the son uh, when he got married with his lovely, lovely wife. Is it that he tried hard to be our son when he was born from the moment he came out of the womb? No, that would be ridiculous. He was our son because, we, because he is our son. And knowing who he was, for him just naturally growing up, he lived like our son. And it's exactly the same principles. It's not, if I try hard enough, God might possibly accept me. No, it is it. God decrees that we are all his precious sons. And it's knowing that we are those precious sons that inspires us and enables us to live like one. So God has qualified us. Now, the background to this verse that I've got up here from Romans 8.15 is this. That in the ancient world, when this was written a couple of thousand years ago, sometimes what happened would be that a poor slave, because there was a lot of slavery in those days, a poor slave would sometimes be taken into a rich family. And that slave child 
would be adopted by that rich family and and granted equal rights and total equality with natural children. Amazing. The slave had no hope, no future, was taken in and given equal status. And that's what Paul has in mind when he says this, you're no longer slaves. Don't think like slaves anymore because that's not who you are. What's going to happen to me? Oh, I've got to fight for myself. Nobody's going to fight for me. No. By the Spirit, you've been adopted to sonship. Equal rights, privilege and status. But despite these truths, Houston, we still have a problem. Because we can read these verses, but often our upbringing, our environment in which we live, Our weakness and sometimes our rebellion as well means that sometimes we still think and feel and therefore speak and act as if we were orphans. You are sons of God if you're born again. But this is what I want to be getting to. The way we think, it's as if we weren't. It's as if we were still orphans. And we must have our mind renewed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So you've been brought into this status and God wants to change the way we think, to line up with the status that we have. Where it says be transformed, it's the word in Greek from which we get our English word metamorphosis. You might, you know, sometimes it's slang. Uh, Sometimes might say, I'll, I'll morph into this. I'll change into this. Meta means everything. So metamorphosis means everything changes. That's God's design for you. He knows it needs changing, but he wants to do it. So what I want to look at from the the word of God today to help us to, to look at our thinking and to begin to get our thinking renewed is this. The parable of the orphan-minded sons, which most of you might know is the parable of the prodigal son or the parable of the lost son. But this angle that I want to take on it, it's saying both of them in different ways were thinking like orphans. Now, I want to focus actually on the elder son, but in order to, to understand and appreciate what the story says about the elder son, we need to look first at the father with the younger son. So let me read through this story to you. I know some of you will be familiar with it, but I'd ask you to, to look at this primarily from the perspective of what was the son thinking? What did his actions betray about his thoughts? Okay, so here's the setting for the story. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, the, the religious people, muttered. I love that phrase, they muttered. This man welcomes sinners oh, and eats with them. So Jesus, in response, actually tells two other parables first and then he comes on to this one. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all that he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that country, in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Remember, this guy's a good Jew. Jews were not very keen on pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to his senses, it's a key phrase out, when he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants, in other words, like even the servants, have food to spare and here I am a son starving to death I will set out and go back to my father and say to him father I've sinned against heaven and against you I'm no longer worthy to be called your son make me like one of your hired servants so he got up and went to his father but you love the buts in the bible <laughs> But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, 
threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, here's his rehearsed prayer, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer be worthy, worthy to be called your son. But the father said to the servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. So let me briefly, just very briefly, you could do a whole sermon on just this bit. Let's look at the father's heart. The father was releasing. He released the son to be responsible for his own actions. He was a seeking father. It says while he was still a long way off, he saw him. In other words, he was out there every day looking for him, scouring the horizon. He was a compassionate father. It says he was filled with compassion. He could have been bitter. He could have been angry. He could have been filled with judgment for his son. But no, he was compassionate. He was an accepting father. He didn't wait for him to have a shower. Just as he was, smelly, stinky, rags. He ran to him and put his arms around him. He loved him just as he was. And then I'm sure he had a bath later. He was a restoring father. Bring the best robe, ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, signs of honor and authority, restoring him to his status. And he was generous. The best food available, music and dancing. So that is the father's heart, very briefly. What about the younger son? Because we're thinking about the sons, being sons of God, how the son thought. What was the younger son's status? We need to know this, that in those days, Slaves went barefoot, but sons wore sandals. So the ring, the robe, and the sandals. These weren't just like mere decoration. Oh, let's make him look, look a bit pretty. You know, let's cover up the dirt and stuff. This was very significant. The son would have realized this. Everybody watching present would have realized this. Oh, he's still a son. He needs sandals on his feet. And the ring and the robe, he's still worthy of honor. You see, it's not that, well, he wasn't my son, but now he is. It's rather this, that he has always been my son. And I've always had a father's heart for him. But now he is visibly restored to what he has always been. He always had that status it was not what about the son did or didn't do it was always about who he was by the decree of the father he wasn't living like it but now he's been restored to it so again just very briefly let's look at the younger son's journey what was the journey not the physical journey that he took away to a far country and back what was going on in his head What was the journey of his thinking and of his understanding of himself? He was basically thinking and acting not like a son, but like an orphan. He wasn't acting as he actually was, of having a father who loved him, who cared for him, who wanted to share everything with him. Why did he go and leave? Why did he turn and back on somebody who loved him so much? He wasn't thinking like a son. He was thinking, I need to sort this out for myself. And we can all be like that. When he squandered his wealth in wild living, he wasn't, he wasn't aware of that status he had. You're thinking, it's the way I'm living my life. It's the way I'm spending my money. Is it worthy of who I am? He wasn't thinking like that. And then even when he started to come back, when he composed his prayer of repentance, this is so crucial and this is what we can think. There was a, there was a critical flaw in his thinking I'm no longer worthy. I can't be your son anymore. The best I could possibly hope for as I approach my father is to be just a hired servant. Wrong, wrong, wrong. But at least even when he was still far away, he knew where he belonged. 
And he did realise who he was. It's my father I'm going to come back to. But he didn't have that security. He didn't have that clarity in his head and feared being disowned. He knew he was coming home. He knew he was coming to his father. But could it possibly be true that his father would still love him as a father and treat him as a son? The younger son had not yet understood the unconditional overwhelming love of a father for his children and I I just want to pause at this moment before I get on to the main thing I I want to say I I know hardly any of you here (laughs) if you are far from God if you know in your own way you've gone to a far country you know whether actually you're you're born again or just just seeking there is a father in heaven who loves you and he wants you home That's how he sees you. He looks past the dirt of your rags from from whatever other way you've lived your life. He sees you. He loves you. He wants you back. And, And you're just a prayer away. He is so eager to have you back. Don't, what a ridiculous thought that we can earn our Father's favor. You don't need to. You don't need to. You couldn't even if you tried but you don't need to. But I want us to look a little bit more about the father and the elder son. So here's the bit which quite often actually gets a little bit overlooked when we look at this, this parable. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. Now, now, now what point, so what response at this point should we expect? We, exactly, we should expect, oh, my brother's back, I want to go and give him a hug. Is that what we found? No, not quite. <laughs> the elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, no, no, he doesn't say my brother, this son of yours, okay, that, that shows what he's feeling. This son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home. You kill the fattened calf for him. See the father's response. My son, the father said, you are always with me. And everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. I just love this. So the first part of the parable we we just just previously looked at concerning the younger brother is clearly an illustration of our Heavenly Father's heart for those who have been far from him but are now returning to him in humility and repentance. And it's an illustration of how On our return, like I said, it is essential to see ourselves as sons, not as orphans. So every time we sin, every time we need to come back because we've fallen short in some way, we must see we are returning home to where we belong because of who we are. But this second part, the second part of the parable concerning the elder brother, who is it aimed at? Who is the elder brother? Well, let's just remind ourselves of the context in which Jesus spoke these parables. We read this at the beginning of it. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering round to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Now, the the tax collectors and sinners, they were the sort of people who had been far away. They were the people who were now repentant and returning and the younger son was an illustration of them. But it was these mutterers, it was the Pharisees 
the teachers of the law, the religious people who were supposedly already close to God. I say supposedly, they knew a lot, but I'm not sure they were close to God. Jesus is saying that you guys as well, in your own different way, you desperately need to hear the Father's heart for you. You need to have your own version of orphan thinking exposed. And there is no doubt at all about this when we see the parallel. So here's the introduction. They muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then we get to the elder son in the parable and the elder son says, when this son of yours comes home, you kill the calf for him. In real life, these people were being welcomed in a party in the parable. The, 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 uh, the younger son was being welcomed. The Pharisees were muttering. The elder son complained. This is exactly who he's talking about. Now let's just understand a little bit more. Who were these religious people? The Pharisees, the teachers of the Lord. They were good Jews. They were the people through whom God had revealed his purposes for mankind. They were the, the carriers of God's revelation, of God's oracles for the world. They had the scriptures showing them what God's character was like. They had the temple in Jerusalem as the focal point of worship. They knew where to worship, they knew what worship was about. They had God's very presence among them. And they were the ones who who genuinely tried to be obedient to God even to the smallest detail. For example, they didn't just give a tenth of their money, they gave a tenth of the herbs that they grew. You know, you only had one offering this morning for the money, where's the offering for the herbs? Okay, that's what they would have said. They, they, they really tried to obey God to the letter. So, especially compared to the, to the supposed bad guys who hadn't lived a good life, the tax collectors and sinners, these people surely were the ones who in some way were already close to God. But what Jesus is saying by giving this second half of the parable is that these people in their own way needed the good news of the gospel just as much. And they needed their own version of orphan thinking to be exposed just as much as the tax collectors and Pharisees. And there's a couple of verses in the book of Ephesians which talks about this, talking about Jesus. He came and preached peace to those who were far away. So an example of this context we're looking at here, the tax collectors, uh, sorry, yeah, the tax collectors and the sinners and also preached peace to those who were near, the Pharisees, the teachers of of the law. Do you consider yourself far away? You need to sacrifice and forgiveness of Jesus for your sin. Do you consider yourself close to God? You need the sacrifice and forgiveness of Jesus for your sin. You might have a different set of sins from a lot of people out there who aren't, who aren't passing through the doors of a church today. But you will never, ever be good enough to approach God by your own efforts. Don't think that. Don't think you can do that. Jesus proclaims peace with God for those who are both far and near. But when we go on to the next verse in this Ephesians passage, what's it for? This is what it's from, to get rid of this bad stuff. What's it for? What is the ultimate goal of Jesus' sacrifice? Forgiveness, yes, but so much more than that because it goes on to say, For through him, through Jesus, we both have access to the Father through the Spirit. This is what it's about. Access to the Father. It is not just, though it's the most amazing, incredible thing, that a judge has declared you not guilty. That is absolutely true. But what's it for? Why has Jesus gone to all this trouble? Why has he had to make this horrendous sacrifice It is so that you can be restored to your Father so that you all, whether you were far or whether you have near, now have access to the Father by one Spirit. This is the big picture 
of why Jesus came and died and rose again to reconcile you, to restore your relationship back to what it always should have been, a personal and intimate relationship with your heavenly Father. So let me ask this question again. Who is this second part of the parable about? It is those people who know something of God and his ways, those people who are genuinely trying to lead lives that please him, those who are in some way already close to God. So, yeah, it's the Pharisees and it's the teachers of the law. Gone too far there. It's the elder brother in the story. But you know, possibly it's you and it's me. Those who are already close to God in some way, but are still thinking in some orphaned thinking. Who needs their orphan thinking exposed? Who needs a greater revelation of the Father's heart? Yeah, the Pharisees and the teachers' law needed it. We can read this parable and think, oh, dreadful. Of course, the older son really needed this. He really needed to understand how much his father loved him. Yes, it's these characters, but actually, it's also possibly you and me. We know that's not who we are, but our thinking can sometimes betray what we really, really think. So let's just look a little bit at the elder son's orphan thinking. The elder son, it says, became angry and refused to go in. When this son of yours who squandered your property comes home, you killed the fattened calf for him. Let me just go back slightly. That's it. I do want to go that one. I need to get maybe reflect, my, change my glasses. I can't quite read the screen at the back properly. <laughs> so I want to ask you to think a little about, a bit, a bit about this. You see, a lack of understanding and, and a genuine personal experience of the Father's heart for us it is often only betrayed when we look at how our own heart and attitude towards other people. So the elder son's attitude was betrayed when the younger son came home, when the party was thrown from the younger son. So I want to ask you to think about one of these situations and think, does any of these things apply to me? How do you respond when other people are successful or blessed are you joyful sharing in their joy I know some of you would be the elder son wasn't it should have been great my brother's home let's have a party he was not joyful he was critical do we celebrate other people's blessings or do we actually criticize their faults well they seem to be a lovely time but I know that there's this wrong with them you might not say it but you can think it if we're British we generally don't say it but we can certainly think it what about say in a work context what about say a colleague at work who is promoted instead of us somebody who's very successful and we felt maybe genuinely that we were better qualified what's the response what's the emotional response that comes along in that situation what about a church context? What about, oh, we hear of a church down the road which is being very successful, but you know, we do have some doubts about their doctrine. We're not sure about their leader. Now, those doubts actually might have some foundation. That's not the point. It's what's our response? What's our heart? Are we looking to celebrate that God is blessing them? Are we looking to share in their joy? What about within our church? What about... A church member who, you know, you've got a little bit of inside knowledge here. You know this, this particular person is not being the most faithful Christian. But they seem to be more joyful than you are. And actually, despite all their faults and their weaknesses, God seems to be using them more than you. Well, that's not fair, is it? I've been, been with God much longer. been living a much more holy life. What is our response you, do, you see, we need to see the grace of God towards sinners is outrageously generous. It isn't treating people as their sins deserve. By human standards, it is outrageous. So are we joyful for other people's success and blessing or 
are we critical? How we see somebody else, how we respond to somebody else can um, say something about our own heart and our own experience of our Heavenly Father. What was the, uh, the next thing that he said? All these, all these years. No, right, it's not one, sorry. <laughs> Is that the right one? <laughs> Thank you. I need my, my, my eyes for me, you see. The second thing he said, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Slaving? Your orders? Is this really how the elder son viewed his father? That really makes me sad. That is a sad perspective that he needed to be set free from. And it is a terrible slur on his father's character that he needed to repent of. He was wrong in how he saw his father. It needed repentance. It needed to change. That was not honoring God, seeing him like that. He was not thinking like the son that he was. He was thinking like an orphan. An orphan is somebody who thinks and acts as if they had no father or mother deeply caring for them. How often can we be like that? How often can we fall into this same false thinking about our heavenly father? I, I, I don't have to think very hard to think of a situation like that. Some, some problem with finances, whether it's in family or whether it's in, in, in church. How easily did I get anxious? As if it's about me and down to me and, and my working hard or even down to us about how well or how generously we do or don't give. How quickly do we, do we think as if God wasn't there watching over us? I, I don't know about you, but sometimes serving God and his family, can, it can sometimes leave me tired and drained. I'm doing the right thing, but doing the right thing is tiring sometimes. I, I can lose my joy and my appreciation of the Father and his love for me. It can feel like a duty serving the church. It can feel like a drudgery sometimes, doing the right thing. Especially if I'm tempted to feel I'm not really appreciated for what I do. I'm doing all this stuff. No, a lot of people don't realise how much stuff I'm doing. and you know, Nobody says thank you to me very often. And, and actually, I don't always see the results that I've been looking for, the fruit that I've been, I've been hoping for. I don't know about you. I need regular reminders of how much God delights in me just for who I am. If I never did anything, if I never served anyone again, he would still say to me, I delight in you. You are my beloved. I need to feel, even as a man, <laughs> I need to feel the pleasure of his favor for just being a son. Why does he favor me? Because I'm a son irrespective of my performance or my so-called success or failure. I'm already a success. <laughs> How can I ever be a failure? I've already succeeded. He's qualified me. I'm a son. That's enough. That's enough to rejoice. That's enough to rest. You know, just, just picture a little, fa a little child on their father's lap snuggling up. There's one on the back row there, which is a very good illustration. Words aren't always needed, are they? Just being close is what's needed. You know, of course a parent loves it when their child is obedient, when they listen and they put things into practice and you know, it's not too embarrassing at the school gate. They, they love that, of course parents love that. But what are parents really happy about? To know that they've got their child's heart. That's what, it, that's what counts. That's what they're really looking for. And this, this is our God. This is his fatherly heart for us. He, he wants you more than your serving. He wants you more than your time and your money. Just wants you. And he wants you to enjoy him wanting you. <laughs> and then the final thing that the son said. He said, you never gave me even a young goat, which was in contrast to the fatted calf, of course. 
so I could celebrate with my friends. The elder son had believed a lie about his father's goodness and generosity towards him. He was believing something that was simply not true. And we need to see this. This is one of the devil's biggest tricks. Lying about God's goodness was a key part of Satan's strategy with Adam and Eve right at the beginning and it has not changed. If he did it with Adam and Eve, he'll try it with you. So we read in Genesis 3, the enemy comes and he says to, to Adam and Eve, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? What's the answer to that? No, God didn't say that. He did not say that. But the enemy took something that God had said and subtly twisted it. So that if Adam and Eve hadn't been alert, and they weren't alert, they would have, they would have started to think, oh yeah, oh yeah, God, this is, this is God's attitude towards me. This, yeah, he's a bit of a spoil sport, isn't he? Yeah, he's not really as, as generous as I, as I thought he was. Lying about God's goodness Making you doubt that he really loves you just because he loves you. He will try it on you. He will keep trying on you in different ways, in different times, in different forms. And coming back to this thing of how we're thinking like sons or orphans, we're thinking like orphans if we allow things like trials, delays, adverse circumstances to paint our picture of God oh this this is what's happening and I don't like it I'm finding it hard or this is what's not happening which I thought would happen oh therefore God must be like this God must be distant God must be angry with me God must not like me very much God must favor other people more than me because I'm finding things hard at the moment you're thinking like an orphan You're allowing your circumstances to paint your picture of God. You're allowing circumstances to dictate what his character is rather than his character then beginning to determine and help you through difficult circumstances. Orphan thinking. It's easy in a worship time. It's not so good when you're at work or when the kids are screaming at home, or when somebody lets you down, a few smiles. It's then, it's when the pressure is on, and we see how we respond, that we realise, oh, I've not yet fully realised, have I, how much of a son I am. So let's, let's finish with this, the father's heart for his son. My son, the father said, you always miss me. My son, not my servant or my slave, my beloved son whom I love and whom whom I'm well pleased. The father's heart for Jesus is the father's heart for us as sons of God. We're wrapped up in him. When the father sees Jesus, he sees us. When he sees us, he sees Jesus. My beloved son in whom I'm pleased. My beloved sons, I am well pleased in you. No conditions attached. My son, who I'm watching over when he goes out and when he comes in. I remember when our son first went to secondary school and there was a school bus which was just about sort of like 100 metres away from our, our, our front door. And I remember, I think it was both of us sort of going up to the bedroom and watching him going over to the bus stop in his oversized uniform because, you know, you buy a uniform that lasts for a few years, don't you, you know? Uh, and uh, thinking, oh, there's our son. You know, we were watching to make sure he was okay, got on the bus okay, or when our children were first old enough to play outside, you're allowed to go up to that lamppost there and that lamppost there. Here's your freedom, what we're doing, up in the bedroom, looking out, making sure they kept to the lampposts. God is watching over you to make sure that you're okay. And if he watches over you in the good times, how much more is he watching over us 
in the dark valleys. It's the dark valleys as well as the green pastures. And there's wonderful words in, in many places. I've suddenly realised why this isn't going. I think it's not, it's, it's not doing all the commands. Like Anyway, sorry, ignore this with the PowerPoint. When you pass through the waters, I'll be with you. When you pass through the rivers, they'll not sweep over you. My son, I'm always with you. I'm always with you. You are always with me because I am always with you. And then he said, the father said to him, everything that I have is yours. Our heavenly father just wants to bless his kids (laughs) so much. If we can work out how to be good parents, which we can be, (laughs) if we can think in anticipation of Christmas, oh yeah, what will my kids like for Christmas? Yeah, they'd love this, they've been hinting it, they'd like that. How much more? If you, who are rubbish in the sense of, you know, you will always fall short, even you, created in the image of God, can have a, a parent's heart for your kids, which of course you can. How much more will the real parent, the real father, the ultimate father, love to give you good gifts? So don't just think, oh, it's God getting me by. It's God getting me through. I need that. You need that. When things are really tough, my God is still with me through the dark valleys. But it's so much more than this. It's God wanting to lead you into your inheritance. This parable was about two sons who were to inherit something. And it's not just getting rid of something. It's what God wants to build into you. It's what God has got in store for you in your lives. It's his plans for you as a church together. It's his plans for you as families, godly generations, one generation after another, loving and serving God. It's about going for it. Not always okay to ask this. It's about what God wants for you. Let's not be polite in our praying. Let's not hold back. As a, and it really, it's just unbelief. Our God wants to bless us like he blessed Abraham and for us to be a blessing like he promised that Abraham would be. So let me tie this up. Whether you're far from God, whether you are near to God, Jesus has given you access to the Father. You can go straight in. You don't even need to knock. (laughs) You just have straight access. So remember what we started with. How are you thinking? Get rid of these lies that that so easily infect us about what our Heavenly Father is is like. Don't, Don't let tiredness or disappointment rob you of your joy. Make sure you celebrate other people's success. Make sure you really celebrate God's outrageous grace towards you and others. If God can celebrate others, even though they're still imperfect, so can you, so can I. And most of all, make sure that you are appreciating and enjoying your Father's presence and His deep unconditional love for you. Think like a son, not like an orphan. How are we thinking? How are we thinking? Are we thinking like that son or are we thinking like an orphan? Let's, let's just pray for a moment. Oh, here am I. I just feel what God wants to emphasize how gracious he is to us. Some of us might be thinking, yeah, that bit, that's me, I've, I've done that, I'm guilty of that. And then we immediately start thinking like the younger son, oh, I need to work hard and uh, try and earn my favor back with God. Stop, stop. Don't think like that. Your God is gracious. Your God is overwhelmingly loving. He is, because of what Jesus has done, he's unconditionally accepting of you. You do not need to clean yourself up. You cannot clean yourself up. 
He's the one who cleans you. Let him put his arms around you first. Oh God, please forgive us, Lord, when, when our thinking isn't what it ought to be, Lord. Forgive us, Lord, when our responses betray something that we're embarrassed by, that we know it shouldn't be. Come to us again, Father. Come to us again. Reveal the depth and the breadth of your enormous, gracious love for us. In Jesus' name, amen.